so that we can. As I say, um, this session is being recorded so we can share it with you and for people who ask us to join us, we're also happy to share it. Um, we'll take questions in the chat and at the end of each session. Um, and so I think without any further ado, I will hand over to Simon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sandy. Let me just uh, share my screen, get the technology to work. Mm -hmm. That big. Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining today's talk. Let me just see if I can find that. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining the, uh, the sessions this lunchtime. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, my name is Simon Pierce. I'm a cardiology consultant at Kingston and St George's Hospitals. Um, and alongside uh, my colleague Dan Sado from King's today, we're going to talk about something which I'm sure is very much on everyone's radar and it's been fairly inescapable in the last uh, year and a bit, uh, and that is COVID. And specifically, what we're going to talk about today is, is long COVID and specifically how it can affect the heart and how we can go about assessing and managing this. So, what I'm going to talk about in my sort of half of the session is, is what is long COVID? How common is it? Uh, how it can affect the heart and also from a practical point of view how do we diagnose cardiac involvement with long COVID how do we assess it and importantly what can we do about it to uh, make the lives of our patients better I'm sure your your practices are probably quite full of people coming in with long COVID symptoms so hopefully some practical advice that can uh, can be helpful for you and the way we're going to run things today is I'm going to do the first half so I'll do a sort of relatively brief talk which will leave plenty of time for questions afterwards so do please uh, think of any questions and put them in the chat as you go along um, or feel free to ask them at the end of my talk as well. And then after we've had a short Q&A at the end of my talk, I'll hand over to Dan Sado, who will do his half of the talk and then take some more questions and anything else at the end there. So, as I'm sure you're all very well, well aware, and uh, I think anyone who reads the newspapers and watches the news has not been able to escape this, COVID-19 has been a big problem in the last year and a half or so. And as we know, COVID-19 is a virus that binds to the ACE2 receptor, uh, which is mostly found in the lungs, but also found in the heart and in various other tissues. Um, and causes a nasty infection. And this is the classical thing that we see people coming into hospital with acute COVID-19 infection. And this is the horrible bilateral pulmonary the infiltrates we see in people with uh, pneumonitis secondary to COVID-19, breathlessness, hypoxia, and very high oxygen requirements. These have seen far too many chest x-rays like this in the course of the last year and a bit. But uh, COVID doesn't just affect the lungs. Um, and I'd, I'd like to stress that one of the other major organ systems that COVID affects and can be quite detrimental to is the heart. Um, and there are several ways in which acute COVID, let's talk about acute COVID for a few minutes before moving on to long COVID. Uh, one of the ways in which, or many ways in which acute COVID can affect the heart, um, and it can be direct damage to the heart, or it can be indirect damage to the heart as part of the, the massive systemic, systemic inflammatory response syndrome that people get uh, in response, or some people get in response to uh, acute COVID. So some of the things we see with acute COVID um, is includes pulmonary embolism, so high risk of thrombosis. We're seeing people with PEs and right heart strain, hypoxia on the back of pulmonary embolus. We're seeing cardiac injury with elevated troponin. And the question has always been asked, could this cardiac injury be because of direct viral infection of the heart? Um, or is this high troponin? Is this left ventricular dysfunction, this inflammatory uh, response we see in the heart part of the systemic inflammatory response illness? And certainly, as more and more data comes out, post-mortem study series and so on, um, it does seem that the majority of people who get elevated troponins and cardiac injury as part of their COVID infection are getting it secondary to a massive systemic inflammatory response or embolism or something like that, rather than direct viral involvement to the heart. We, we do occasionally see virus in post-mortem samples um, from people with cardiac involvement of, of COVID, but it tends to be extracellular and it's thought to be uh, not causing the majority of the damage. This is all part of a systemic inflammatory response problem. Um, in a minority of cases, they might also get a Takotsubo type of stress response if they're very unwell. Because it predisposes to thrombosis, but like any other severe infection, you're more likely to get a type 1 myocardial infarction and a traditional heart attack in the context um, of COVID. But probably that's a minority of cases. And if you look at the pie, pie chart, which is a bit, uh, a bit graphical, but, it's, uh, but it shows that the vast majority of cases of myocardial injury with acute COVID are secondary to other things such as pulmonary embolism, critical illness, multi organ failure tachycardia, sympathetic nerve system activity, uh, arrhythmias, AF, and, and non-sustained VT, and so on, being much more common in very sick people with COVID, hypotension, under perfusion of the heart and tissues, and hypoxemia. So it's thought to be mostly a secondary thing rather than uh, due to direct involvement of the heart. But of course, it is all due to COVID. And this diagram really just shows the, the interplay between uh, cardiovascular disease and COVID. Uh, so one of the first things that really was teased out during the COVID pandemic was that if you had pre-existing heart disease, and this includes heart failure, ischemic heart disease, 
uh, hypertension, associated conditions such as obesity, diabetes, you were much more likely to do badly with COVID. So if you looked at the, the numbers of people being admitted to hospital, and particularly those being admitted to intensive care units, the sickest patients with COVID, there's a disproportionate representation of people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So having these pre-existing heart problems uh, seems to hugely predispose to ending up very sick with your, uh, with your COVID. Uh, but of course, once you then get COVID, the COVID itself can affect the heart uh, via acute cardiac injury, whether that's direct infection or whether that's part of the inflammatory response, uh, causing a myocarditis, acute coronary syndromes, arrhythmias, VTAF, and um, thromboembolism. So it's, it's a pretty a two-way process whereby you're more likely to get bad COVID than once you get bad COVID, it affects your heart further, or even gives you de novo heart disease if, uh, if you didn't have heart problems to start with in, in some unfortunate people. And just at the bottom of your screen down here, uh, I'm sure you remember when COVID first came along, there's a lot of excitement about whether or not ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers were going to make you more likely to get bad COVID um, because of potentially increasing your expression of the ACE2 protein. Now, very pleased to say, as I'm sure you know, that the studies have not shown this and actually continuing your ACE and your ARB appears to be uh, safe unless you're hemodynamically unstable. So that's, that's very good news, obviously, for our heart failure patients because we do know that stopping these drugs is bad if you have heart failure. So that's... That's acute COVID, and now I'm going to move on to what really is uh, the sort of focus of today's talk, and that is that's what's known as long COVID. Now, long COVID, of course, is a, a sort of um, colloquial term. It's not the proper medical term. The proper medical term for long COVID is post-acute COVID. But it's not quite as catchy, so I think for the purpose of this, we'll keep calling it long COVID. And by definition, this is when a person still has symptoms or signs of COVID infection four weeks or more um, after their initial acute COVID infection. So in most cases, this is after the virus is no longer um, isolatable via PCR from the nasopharynx. Um, the viral load has gone right down, but these people still have ongoing symptoms. Uh, and, the, and there's a lot of different symptoms that people can get. They vary a lot from person to person. Um, not everyone has all of them. Some have some, and you can, you can almost cherry pick which ones they get. But the, the common things that people complain of, and I'm sure you've had patients coming to your clinics complaining of things like this, um, are profound fatigue. So people just are exhausted. They can't do anything. Minimal exercise, and they're exhausted. Um, quality of life goes down, muscle and joint pain and weakness, ongoing breathlessness being a major problem, cough. Uh, some people are persistently hypoxic. Um, from a neurological point of view, not surprisingly, anxiety and depression, sleep disturbance, PTSD for those who are very sick with it. Um, and this thing called brain fog, this is very surprisingly common where people just feel they can't concentrate, they can't think and process thoughts the way they used to. Very frustrating for people. They find it hard to get back to work and headaches. Now, moving on to the heart, uh, so palpitations, chest pain are two big things, but also dizziness. Do they have blood pressure issues? Do they have arrhythmias making them dizzy? Uh, do they have heart failure? If you've had an acute cardiac injury in the context of your acute, uh, your acute COVID or ongoing cardiac inflammation, have you ended up with left ventricular failure causing you breathlessness? So a lot of these symptoms could be explained by underlying heart disease. So this is why it's so important not to forget the heart when patients have these symptoms. Thromboembolism, people presenting late with pulmonary emboli or, or emboli elsewhere, can affect your kidney and other things like hair loss and so on that people get as well. So lots of different things that people come to the clinics, and this is not an exhaustive list at all, there are many other things. So how common is it? Well, it depends which study you look at and then which, which population you sample. Um, this, this top study, and it's the graph on your right, was actually an Italian study uh, looking at people who'd been hospitalised, and they, they sent questionnaires out to people two months after they were hospitalised. Um, and you can see the list of the most common things up there being fatigue, dyspnea, joint pain, chest pain, cough, and so on. Um, but more than half of people two months down the line still had fatigue as a prominent symptom. 43% were still breathless, 22% were still getting chest pain two months down the line. Um, so really, if you're looking for this, these symptoms in people who are admitted to hospital, they're surprisingly and perhaps frighteningly common. Uh, from our own shores, that I'm sure you're all aware of the King's College uh, study done via the app. I'm sure some of you have this on your mobile phones, and I'm sure lots of your patients do too. So this is more looking at patients, the majority of whom were not sick enough to need hospitalisation. These were people who were um, just self-isolated and, and managed to get through their symptoms at home. But still, 13% of these people with milder COVID still had symptoms four weeks later. So if you think there are four and a half million people that we know of in this country who've had COVID, and probably about as many who've had COVID and we don't know about, um, as well as how many million around the world, there's an awful lot of people um, who have or have had uh, long COVID symptoms in the course of the last year and a bit. So who gets it? So in terms of sort of predisposing factors to getting this kind of long COVID syndrome, uh, it is more common in women, about twice as common in women than men in this particular series, more common in older people, more common in people that had more symptoms during their acute illness, 
Uh, overweight people are more likely to get it. Not surprisingly, people with chronic respiratory disease are more likely to get it. And if your acute COVID was worse, you're more sick with your acute COVID, uh, you're more likely to get a long COVID symptoms. And, and this is what the graph on the right shows. The, the orange bars are patients who were admitted to intensive care um, and the blue bars are patients who were just admitted to the general ward. And what you can see really is the long COVID symptoms are much more prevalent in those who were sicker and needed intensive care than those admitted to the ward. Perhaps not surprising, but actually even people with mild symptoms, uh, which the King's College study shows us, um, suggest that uh, they can still get significant long COVID symptoms, even if they weren't that sick to start with. So it's a bit, uh, a bit concerning, I'd say. So moving on to the symptoms related to the heart in particular. So these are the common things or the things that people can complain of uh, with long COVID. So chest pain, which uh, Dan is going to talk about uh, shortly, uh, palpitations and dizziness, which I'm going to touch on, breathlessness and, and also fatigue can of course be a sign of heart disease. So focusing on those two in particular, why might somebody with long COVID and cardiac involvement have palpitations? Um, so we see a lot of this, this concept of inappropriate sinus tachycardia. This is in common with, with lots of pre people that get viral illnesses or other illnesses in the past. They, they get an ongoing tachycardia, which is disproportionate to um, any requirement for there to be a tachycardia. So this is a, a rest, this is a minimal exertion, they've got a fast heart rate for no particularly good reason. And of course, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to make sure it's not an appropriate sinus tachycardia due to some diagnosis that we've missed, uh, which is that one. Of course, there are so many people out there who've, who've got COVID or had COVID, but they are going to have other tachyarrhythmia arrhythmias. Um, so just because someone's had COVID doesn't mean they're not getting symptomatic ventricular ectopics or AF or some other arrhythmia they would have had anyway. But of course, having COVID increases the risk of having these arrhythmias as well. So it may well be one of these other arrhythmias which COVID is either predisposed to or just happens to be coming on after COVID because there are so many people knocking around the country who've had COVID. And don't forget that people's perception of, of palpitations is very much driven by anxiety and depression often. Um, things like ventricular ectopic beats, even normal sinus tachycardias. Uh, when you have problems with anxiety and depression, which we know are very common after COVID, you are more likely to be aware of these things. And of course, that can drive a, a sinus tachycardia as well. We know that's common after COVID. One of the other things I'm going to talk about, which brings palpitations and dizziness together, is this thing called POTS, which I'm sure you're, you're all quite familiar with, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And this is, I'll talk about it shortly, but this is a thing where you have dysregulation of your normal heart rate control on changes in posture, which can give you fast palpitations when you stand up and can make you feel dizzy and wheezy as well. Uh, obviously, dizziness could be due to these other arrhythmias your patient may have if they're having heart block or fast AF or whatever it happens to be. Um, vasovagal syncope is thought to be more common after viral illnesses like COVID. Uh, orthostatic hypotension as well, probably more common after, after COVID. And of course, there are lots of other reasons they might be dizzy. So are they on medicines that make them dizzy? Have they got left ventricular dysfunction that's making them dizzy? And um, what else could be going on? Are they hypovolemic? Do they have ongoing infection somewhere that's making their blood pressure drop and making them dizzy? So lots of possible reasons why people might have these symptoms. So just to talk through a few of those. So inappropriate sinus tachycardia. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. And so you need to make sure it's not an appropriate sinus tachycardia. So by definition, this is where your heart rate is more than 100 at rest uh, or on minimal exercise disproportionate to your physiological state. So there's no explanation for that. Um, it's usually a benign thing. So if it's just a benign sinus tachycardia, it normally gets better in the long term and you only treat it if the person is symptomatic. Uh, but of course you do need to make sure there's not a serious underlying cause for it like heart failure, anemia, and electrolyte disturbance, whatever it happens to be. It may be due to a post-infective inflammatory state and ongoing cytokine release. It's reasonable to investigate the 24-hour take to see what the overall rate is and make sure it's not just the stress of coming to the doctor that's put their heart rate up. Um, and in terms of what you do about it, you exclude the reversible causes, because as I say, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, you can reassure the patient, you can do lifestyle measures, exercise, you're eating healthily, keeping well hydrated, managing stress, all these things that you can do to make this better. If the person has persistent symptoms, then it's ru ruining their quality of life. You can control it with beta blockers, uh, plus minus ivabradine, slow down the sinus mode, or diltiazem or verapamil alternatives if you absolutely have to. But in the majority of cases, you try and man manage this very conservatively, and as the infection uh, sort of disappears off into the past, it should get better. So appropriate sinus tachycardia, of course, is all about underlying the cause and the, uh, finding the underlying cause. And this is, of course, the differential diagnosis for inappropriate sinus tachycardia. So if you've got a patient who says, you know, my heart's racing all the time, doctor, and you feel their pulse and it's 120 beats a minute sat in a chair, 
Um, yes, it might be an inappropriate sinus tachycardia following COVID that will eventually get better, um, but make sure they're not hyperthyroid, hypoxic, anemic, uh, ongoing infection, electrolyte abnormalities. Think about doing a chest x-ray to make sure there's no ongoing infiltration there that might be causing a tachycardia. Think about a blood gas or even arterial gas to, um, to make sure they're not hypoxic or with electrolyte services or high lactate. Could there be an anxiety component to this? And have a look at the drugs and make sure they're not taking anything uh, that might be speeding their heart up. And don't forget that just because they've had COVID doesn't mean they haven't got other things going on. So they may have AF, they may have flutter, they may have SVTs. Uh, they might have symptomatic ventricular ectopics and heaven forbid they might have VT as well. But if you do see this in somebody that's had COVID, um, always think, is there an underlying problem with the heart? Has the COVID affected their heart? Have they got left ventricular dysfunction, uh, fibrosis in the heart, something else that might be predisposing uh, to this uh, to this arrhythmia? So listen to the heart, check the blood pressure, do the ECG, uh, think about doing a BNP level, think about doing a troponin level, and think about specialist referral. So that brings me on to dizziness in long COVID. So again, lots of possible causes that your patient coming to clinic might feel dizzy in, this, in the context of a long COVID uh, syndrome. It may have been caused be due to arrhythmia. Have they gone into AF? Have they got lots of ectopics? Is there something else going on that's making them dizzy? Or could it be related to this group of conditions known as the orthostatic intolerance syndromes, uh, which we think are much more common after viral illnesses, including COVID? And this includes POTS, which I mentioned before, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, vasovagal syncope, and orthostatic hypertension. Um, but don't, think, don't forget there are other things that can make people dizzy, such as anxiety and depression, hypotension, hypovolemia, certain medications, and of course, left ventricular dysfunction, potentially. So just talk a little bit about POTS. So we know from a lot of people that get POTS, uh, describe a, a pre-proceeding a, a pre, um, viral illness. Um, so it's, we've never been able to identify exactly what it is. People have checked autoantibodies and so on. It's very hard to pin down exactly what, what can cause it. But certainly it does seem to be an increase of POTS after the viral infection. There appears to be an increased risk after COVID based on case series and case reports, because the evidence is, is fairly thin at the moment because it's not been around for very long. Um, lots of theories as to why you might get this response in COVID. Uh, is it due to hypovolemia, bed rest and deconditioning, like we see in astronauts coming down from space stations? Could it be because COVID is affecting your peripheral or your central sympathetic nervous system? Uh, or could it be due to an autoimmune reaction where you produce antibodies that start affecting your, uh, your nervous response? And what POTS is, is essentially where you get a rise in your, inappropriate rise in your heart rate when you stand up. So you lie somebody down or sit somebody down for five minutes, you then stand them up and you monitor their heart rate and their blood pressure over the next three minutes. Uh, and if your heart rate goes up by more than, there's 40 here, but I think the definition is usually 30, uh, 30 beats per minute, um, that's thought to be an abnormal tachycardia response, and that would be in keeping with the diagnosis of POTS in the presence of, of uh, symptoms. And you might get a bit of a drop in your blood pressure as well, but it's, it's usually not a huge drop in the blood pressure. It's the tachycardia that people get when they stand up and makes them feel really awful. Um, so as I say, measure, if you do see somebody who's complaining of postural type symptoms, think about measuring their lying blood pressure and heart rate, and then stand them up and three minutes later do it again. And if the heart rate's gone up by more than 30, uh, then that's a sign that they might have POTS and that it would be appropriate to refer on at that point if they're symptomatic um, for consideration of tilt table testing. Other things that might cause dizziness in long COVID, so vasovagal, as you know, this is usually situational. Um, if they're vasodilated, ongoing infection, emotion, hypovolemia, all these things make it more likely. Um, orthostatic hypotension, so this is your postural hypotension, patients that have a drop of more than 20 in their systolic blood pressure when they stand up without an associated tachycardia so that differentiates it from POTS um, again due to autonomic dysfunction hypovolemia and deconditioning and this is something I sort of scribbled on the back of an envelope but might might be a way of thinking about approaching a patient with dizziness or, or palpitations post uh, post COVID infection so first question to ask is are, are the dizziness or palpitations postural in nature if they are then you're automatically thinking of one of these autonomic postural syndromes that we, we looked at before, your sort of POTS type syndromes. So it would be appropriate to do a lying and standing heart rate and blood pressure, so sit them down for five minutes, measure their heart rate and blood pressure, stand them up and do it again three minutes later. Um, if you get a spike in the heart rate from more than 30, that would point towards a diagnosis of POTS. Um, if you get a drop in the blood pressure without an associated spike in the heart rate, that might be keeping with orthostatic hypotension, or of course it might be normal. Um, and it would be appropriate as a first measure to consider lifestyle measures for all of these things. So exercise, weight loss, eating healthily, keeping really well hydrated, uh, putting a bit of extra salt on your food if your blood pressure is a bit low, um, and avoiding anything that precipitates it, like dehydration, alcohol, caffeine, uh, getting too hot, emotional, stressful situations, anything that the patient thinks might make their symptoms worse, 
it's appropriate to try conservative measures first. If these conservative lifestyle measures don't work, um, then it's absolutely appropriate to refer these patients up to a cardiologist uh, for consideration of tilt table testing to make a firm diagnosis and think about drug treatment for them. Um, if the symptoms are not postural, uh, then palpitations obviously make sense to do an ECG and a 24 hour tape. Um, and if there's an abnormality or if they are persistent symptoms that perhaps haven't been picked up during the 24 hour of monitoring, monitoring uh, then absolutely specialist referral up to a cardiologist would be appropriate. Um, if it's more of a situational vasovagal syncope, then obviously that tends to be managed conservatively. Uh, this is from the ESC guidelines, the things I've really mentioned really to do with managing orthostatic hypertension. So make sure they stay hydrated, stop the salt, stop any drugs that might be causing it. Think about compression garments, stockings, squeezing the calves or buttocks to get the blood up to the head. You can, the two drugs that can work for, for postural hypotension are midodrin, uh, causing peripheral vasoconstriction or fluid cortisone, causing salt and water retention, obviously cautious, caution in heart failure, usually conservative measures, and this will get better on its own, but those drugs are available if it needs to be. There are some websites available for support, such as stopfainting.com, there's the STARS uh, charity and Arrhythmia Alliance as well. So educating patients and, and, and giving them that, that confidence to manage their symptoms is a really big part of this. In terms of POTS, so very similar lifestyle measures. You can see the cartoon on the right, salt and water to keep well hydrated and keep the blood pressure up. Exercise training, so practicing getting up and down, sleeping slightly propped up can be helpful. Um, fitness or rehab type classes can be helpful. Psychological support is quite a big thing with this. There's quite a lot of overlap with chronic fatigue syndromes and so on. So getting, the, getting an interested psychologist involved can be very helpful. And if all of that fails, then low dose propranolol, 20 milligrams three times a day can be quite effective. Um, Ivabridine can help with the tachycardia. And if there's a big blood pressure component to it, the blood pressure is dropping, then again, midodrine as a peripheral vasoconstrictor or fluidocortisone as a salt and water retainer. Um, if the blood pressure is low, are drugs that you can use for, for managing their symptoms. So, so to conclude, so cardiac symptoms are common in non-COVID, particularly the chest pain and the palpitations and the dizziness and the breathlessness. Um, lots of possible mechanisms, lots of possible underlying etiologies. So please do think about uh, simple postural testing, an ECG, a 24-hour tape. Think about checking a troponin and a BNP in these patients uh, to make sure there's no ongoing problems with the heart there. For a lot of these things, lifestyle measures, reassurance uh, can be of huge benefit. Um, drug therapy might improve symptoms as well, but if you're really struggling or if they have abnormalities there, please do think about referring on uh, for specialist help. And of course, this is all very new. Evidence evol is evolving. So I suspect in six months' time, we'll know much more about this than we do now. So, uh, so watch this space, and I'm sure there'll be much more evidence coming out in the journals in the coming months and years. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'll wrap up there. So we went on a little bit longer than I was expecting to. Uh, let me stop screen sharing and then go back to the main thing. Uh, good, so just in the next few minutes, let's answer a few of your questions. Uh, scroll down. Uh, my mouse isn't working. Uh, so a question saying, we've been inundated with patients with palpitations, often 20 to 30 years old. Uh, we're struggling to know how to investigate proportionately and without flooding the diagnostic service, e.g. do you stop at a 12 lead ECG, do you get a 24 hour tape, an echo, a reveal, a BNP, a TFT, full blood count. I mentioned consider but struggling to know where to stop. I think pretest probabilities can help us rationalize things. Yeah, you're absolutely, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's extremely difficult. As you say, we have an awful lot of 20 and 30 year olds who are getting palpitations on the, on the back of it. I, I hope that maybe the algorithm I showed might be a little bit helpful, but I think, um, I think the first thing to do is to investigate whether these are postural symptoms or not. So is this a postural orthostatic hypertension type syndrome? Um, do they need salt and water? Um, do they need lifestyle measures? Do that as a conservative first thing for the majority of people if there are no red flag symptoms. Um, and if you're really struggling despite conservative measures, and I think that's the point at which um, you consider specialist referral. Um, obviously ask about red flag symptoms such as dizziness or syncope associated with the palpitations. Um, I suspect not many of the patients have that. Um, in young people, it's fairly unlikely they've got any major uh, heart problems, but of course, if they have, have, have had COVID, it is it's not a bad idea to check a troponin and a BNP level on them to make sure they haven't got ventricular dysfunction. We are seeing this in young people that have profound inflammatory responses to uh, their initial COVID, uh, COVID infection, that they might have an elevated BNP and some left, left ventricular dysfunction afterwards. Um, so I think if it all sounds more relatively benign, you can probably stop at a 12 lead ECG and conservative measures. If there's any red flag symptoms or signs such as an elevated BNP, an elevated troponin, um, or you know, a very abnormal ECG or syncope or something like that, then that's the point at which you refer on. But I agree, it's very difficult. There are so many patients out there. Um, 
hopefully things like the kinesis system and so on that we have here at Kingston. I'm sure some of you have equivalents might be helpful. Um, how does troponin remain raised after acute COVID-19 infection? Uh, good question and hugely variable, actually. I don't know, Dan, are you talking about that in your talk at all with your chest pain hat on? Sorry. I mean, yes, yes, we'll cover a bit of this. There's a question, there's a question about a male chat with myocarditis that's just come on that we, it's up to you, you're welcome to discuss, but uh, that will come up a little bit in what I'm going to do. So, yeah, so maybe I should leave that to you then if you're going to talk about myocarditis and so on rather than stealing your thunder on that one. Um, and it's actually two o'clock, so maybe it's best if I hand over to Dan at this point and then uh, I'm sure he can answer, answer the questions about the myocarditis and the troponin. And if there's any other burning questions about either talk, um, then we can answer both of them at the end. If that's okay, so over to you, Dan. I just say thank you very much, Simon. Um, there was one last question. I don't know if you answered it. Where do, you, where do people refer for tilt testing and how long's the wait? Uh, the wait's quite so it, it, it's mostly done in the specialist centres. So, uh, so sort of Kings or the Brompton or the Hammersmith have big tilt table testing centres. Um, in terms of the wait, Dan, you probably know more about that than I do from the King's point of view. Uh, last I knew, so I, I very rarely refer. So, we many of you will know who are local to us. There's a chap called Nick Gall here who is a national lead on POTS, uh, and therefore anyone who kind of gets to the point of needing tilt table testing, to be honest with you, is just generally going to end up going through him. Uh, the last I knew, the waiting time was long, like months type thing. Um, so, yes, it is, it's not short. Thank you. There are, there are yeah. <laughs> do you want to do it? There, there's, there's, there's a question here about does, pre does deconditioning predispose to vasovagals? Do you, do you want to do it? Because I'm happy to, to. Do you want to go for it? Yeah, well, so probably is the answer. Um, I, I'm not familiar with any particular evidence one way or another, but uh, we know that any kind of deconditioning, particularly if patients have been in bed for a long time, affects your autonomic nervous system's response to things. So I'm sure that uh, the deconditioning, I'm sure, does, pre does predispose to vasovagals and uh, encouraging people to do their exercises and get back to getting up and down and walking around and getting their fitness levels back up again will be helpful in these situations, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. I definitely think deconditioning is part of the problem that you're seeing with a lot of this stuff. Uh, so I, I agree. And then the last question was, what's related to psychosomatic symptoms, question mark? Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a sort of political hot potato, isn't it? The, the, the POTS are quite, the, the POTS group are quite, um, quite active online, should we say. There's quite, quite a big sort of uh, community of people with POTS who are quite, quite, they tend to be young people, so they tend to be quite active on, on Twitter and on various websites and then pressure groups and so on. Um, so there's no doubt that in some people there is a significant psychosomatic aspect to POTS. Um, it, it sort of fits in the same, you know, like a sort of Venn diagram. You have some people that have very physiological POTS and some people that have slightly more psychological POTS, maybe in the same way that you might do with irritable bowel syndrome or some of these other more functional disorders. Um, and, and patients do fit somewhere on that, that sort of scale between those that are very physiological and those that are a bit more psychological. So that's really why I mentioned psychological support as being important for, for people who are at that end of the scale with their POTS, um, because actually getting people control of their symptoms and, and learning to manage their symptoms and not panicking with their symptoms and manage their, managing their anxiety and whatever else might be driving their, their abnormal autonomic responses is, is a big part of treating this effectively. Thank you very much, Simon. I will hand over to Dan. Thank you so much. So, so my name is Dan Sado. Uh, I'm a consultant at King's College Hospital. Um, and I'm going to open up with something a little bit different uh, with a poll uh, for you. So let me just launch it. So, he's, hang on, I think that's the wrong poll. Hang on, sorry, my fault. Let me get rid of that and just start again. Sorry, there's four polls in this. I just need to the right one number two there we go uh, relaunch continue right. hopefully you're seeing the correct poll now uh, so in a poll of cardiologists what job do you think we would most have wanted to do if it hadn't have been a doctor so do you think teacher fighter pilot formula one racing driver golfer or prime minister probably not prime minister after dominic cummings yesterday Got one for professional golfer. That was me. <laughs> That's my love. It's my second love in life. Formula One race driver, 46%. 50% Formula One race driver. 
Okay, so let's stop there. You can see the results of this. <clears throat> So most of you think that cardiologists, if they hadn't been doctors, would have been Formula One race car drivers, 27% for fighter pilot, and then 13% for teacher or professional golfer. Let's get rid of that. So the answer to the question actually was fighter pilot with Formula One race driver coming in second. This is not lost on uh, cardiologists and particularly not on those who manufacture stuff that they want us to buy. So in the cath lab, you actually have balloons that are called Maverick balloons. Many of you who uh, follow Top Gun will know that the lead in Top Gun, of course, was called Maverick. And many of you will also uh, perhaps drive a BMW car. You can actually get BMW guide wires. That stands for balance middleweight. And I'm sure they could have found a way to fit Skoda guide wire uh, for something that sounded vaguely meaningful. But of course, BMW clearly was to no doubt appeal to the sort of uh, Formula One wannabe racing drivers. And the reason I bring this up is because in effect, when you deal with cardiologists, you're actually dealing with a bunch of failed fighter pilots. And that's quite important because that is not conducive to looking after patients with post-COVID syndrome. This is a group of people who'd be rather firing sidewinder missiles and looking after patients with post-COVID syndrome, which one might argue is the other end of the spectrum. To put it in perspective, uh, so Simon and myself work together across a pan-London group of cardiologists who have formed, if you like, a group uh, to look at post-COVID syndrome uh, and what we're doing with it, what the patients come in with, how we should best uh, treat patients. I wrote an email and bear in mind them as, training pro as a training program director. So all the trainees in South Thames, I mean something to them, <laughs> if you like. So I wrote to them and said, does anybody want to do any work with us and uh, potentially uh, get, get a good sort of potential, at least a regional quality improvement project out of it for your CV? Might even get a national quality improvement project. Not a single one of our registrars replied to that email. They didn't even reply to say no, they were so desperate not to be involved with this. So this is not a popular subject uh, for cardiologists. Uh, and so a few of us have sort of taken it on, but it's not a popular subject. My own interest in this comes from uh, doing cardiac MRI, which lends itself to myocarditis, which you've uh, asked about in the chat uh, thread. Uh, and with Hannah Sinclair in the Southeast London side, we sort of lead the post-COVID cardiology side. So talk a little bit about epidemiology. In fact, I'm really just going to cover that very briefly because Simon's already done it. Um, a bit about etiology uh, in terms of acute versus post-COVID syndrome presentations of chest pain, uh, investigation and management strategies. So acute stuff. We've already covered this. So the next poll asks you a question, which hopefully you're all going to get right. So let's move on to the next one. Relaunch. Perfect. So what might be the etiology of chest pain in acute COVID-19? So your acute patient, might it be musculoskeletal, viral, myocarditis, viral pericarditis, could be an infarct, or do you think it could be any of the above? So I'll just give you another few seconds. So musculoskeletal chest pain is quite common in COVID-19 because people have often been hacking away with a cough particularly, or they might have had all sorts of other things that might have pushed that depending, but it's not uncommon to see potentially. So it might be musculoskeletal, myocarditis more common in COVID-19 infection as is pericarditis, as is myocardial infarction because of the thrombotic issues. The answer to this question as 13 of you said is actually is all of the above any one of these might be a cause of chest pain in your acute COVID-19 uh, presentation. Okay, so that's the acute stuff. I sort of would often add to that in terms of how COVID-19 might present. One of the other things you might want to have in the back of your mind, a patient who's got known ischemic heart disease, if they get COVID infection, they may end up precipitating worsening angina on the back of that. So if they become hypoxic, that's going to potentially make angina worse. But the majority of what we're seeing is de novo presentations in the chest pain side of things in hospital acutely, myocarditis, pericarditis, or myocardial infarction. But we've already sort of looked at some of that, and really the point of this was to more talk about post-COVID syndrome, a different group of patients. So let's get to the next poll. <clears throat> 
it up on here. So which of these is the most common cause of chest pain in post-COVID syndrome? MI, no cause found, myocarditis, pericarditis, or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? give you another few seconds to see if anybody else wants to right so 64% no cause 21% myocarditis 14% pericarditis in terms of post-covid syndrome Takotsubo cardiomyopathy that's broken heart syndrome which is something that would happen acutely so that isn't in the in the equation here. Myocardial infarct would be the same. It's going to be more of an acute presentation. So you're really left with this: pericarditis, myocarditis, no cause found. My experience with this thus far in long COVID clinics is that number two is my far the most common with chest pain. You do a whole load of tests and you don't find the answer in the majority of these patients with this. Myocarditis we're going to discuss because that has caused a huge amount of debate amongst the cardio in the cardiology world with this. But the majority, even whatever data one chooses to believe, the majority of patients with chest pain and post-COVID syndrome will not have obvious acute myocarditis with it. So often you'll find nothing if you go looking. So a lot of these patients go through MRI scan, CT scan. Uh, you often won't find stuff with this, although you sometimes do. So what might we think about? So the physical stuff, a lot of that we sort of talked about in part one uh, of this, the things that you might want to think about happening that happen acutely. But the majority uh, won't have a physical problem in post-COVID syndrome with chest pain. So in terms of what you might want to do in primary care with this, with the patient who comes in with this sort of presentation, post-COVID syndrome and chest pain, what might you want to do? The history is going to be key, as it is for all things. What's the nature of the pain? Is it exertion related? Do they have risk factors for coronary disease? Those things are going to be absolutely critical to what you do or don't decide to do with the patient. If somebody's got exertional symptoms, you're going to end up referring them to a rapid access chest pain clinic. I mean, if the symptoms are purely exertional, it's going to be very difficult not to take that forward. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, if it's somebody who's very young with no risk factors, you're probably not going to find anything. But if they are giving you a story that's entirely exertional, I cannot see how in the end you're not going to end up making a referral to secondary or tertiary care in the end with that. I think it's very, very likely. And from our point of view, you know, that's not a referral we would bounce. The more difficult group, because most won't be like that, are going to be maybe some exertional features, but not always. So the you know, patients say sometimes when I'm doing stuff, sometimes not, sometimes when I sit up, sometimes not. this sort of thing is much more common in my experience with this. I think the patient with a lot of cardiac risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors, so if this is a heavy smoking diabetic whose dad dropped dead when they were age 40, again, you're going to end up referring. You know, it's going to be very difficult to manage that conservatively, I think, in primary care. The more common story, though, of course, is this is a young, more commonly young female with no risk factors and a story that's a bit exertional and a bit not. That's your most common group in post-COVID syndrome. If you're going to go looking for ischemic heart disease in that group, your yield is going to be incredibly low. I haven't had one yet that's presented like this with exertional, non-exertional symptoms uh, and no risk factors where we've actually found severe ischemic heart disease yet. It's not impossible. But going down the coronary route is unlikely to yield you much. But of course, it leads to the question of could this be myocarditis, which is what uh, one of the questions was during the previous talk. So what is myocarditis? So inflammation of heart muscle, most commonly seen in association with viral disease. But you can see in all sorts of other walks of medicine. So you see it in autoimmune disease, for example. And I mean, as Simon discussed, it's unclear whether it's to do with viral invasion or systemic inflammatory response. I agree with him, and I think the data is very much more pushed towards suggesting that in COVID it's to do with systemic inflammatory response, not direct viral invasion. Um, that's my view as well. It can present in all sorts of different ways. So often it's a minor problem. Uh, so we see it quite on this, you know, we saw myocarditis long predating COVID-19. It probably saw maybe a case or two a week here, a uh, king sort of thing. So it's not an uncommon problem. 
Um, it's often mild and self-limiting. Patients will get chest pain acutely with it, and then by the time they leave hospital, it will have gone. Uh, usually the troponin will have come down and it will have gone. It can be aggressive, it can cause heart failure, and it can present really aggressive with cardiogenic shock and at its worst end of the spectrum death. But the majority of patients with this tend to have a minor illness. The instance is unclear in COVID-19, and we're going to talk about why that, why I make that statement. Um, it often presents with chest pain. It often mimics myocardial infarction, actually, acutely, because the myocardium is very inflamed, as it is in infarct. You may get ST elevation on ECG, for example. So the next poll is this one. Let's this is the last poll. Which non-invasive test has the highest sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of myocarditis? Is it serum troponin, 12 lead ECG, MRI, CT, or echo? Just give you another few seconds to see who else wants to fill this in. So one of my best friends is an actor and often seems to come out with a statement of know your audience. And clearly you have all guessed your audience with me. So I actually lead the cardiac MR service at King's. So this is perhaps a way to question, but the answer is cardiac MRI is 93% of you got. The, the reason I say this is serum troponin is very, very sensitive for this. So if you've got minor bits of heart inflammation, if you've got any sort of anything like that in the muscle, it will tend to leak troponin. So you will see um, troponin in blood when you measure it as a result of that. So it's a very sensitive way of looking for it, but it's very poorly specific because there are many reasons why that might happen that may not be myocarditis. 12 lead ECG is the same issue, that it has some sensitivity, but the specificity is poor. CT is no good for looking at myocardium, it's good for looking at the blood supply to it. So we use it for ischemic heart disease, not for this problem. Echo actually quite lack sensitivity and specificity because all it can show you is warm motion abnormality and many patients with myocarditis have normal LV function. So we often do it, but actually if you're on a desert island and you could only have one imaging test for this problem, you would definitely have an MRI scan. The reason we like MRI is, I shall show you in the next slide. He says in the next slide, so that just sums up what I've just said. You get more bang for your buck with it. So you see the heart moving which you see on echo. So this bit of it here, the cine imaging that I showed you here, actually doesn't add a lot in a lot of patients. Where you do get additional benefit is the T2 imaging here. So T2 looks for water. So normal in this particular image here, so this is the left ventricle here. So this is blood in the middle, all the bright stuff here. That's the left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle. And this is the left ventricular myocardium around the outside here. Normal myocardium will look quite purple and the more water there is in it, the brighter it looks. So you see here, it's quite bright in that little area. That's for the water edema. That's in effect myocardial inflammation. We then give contrast, gadolinium contrast, and that can tell you what the cause of that inflammation is when it spares the subendocardium, the bit in the middle, sorry, the bit on the edge here, that tells you it's a non-ischemic process. So this is a patient actually who's got COVID myocarditis, acute COVID myocarditis. So it takes you beyond what you get with troponin uh, and echo by actually trying to tissue characterize the myocardium. You're going to generally treat, and myocarditis is generally going to be treated in secondary or tertiary care. Uh, so patients have often presented acutely uh, with it. So it's generally going to be something that we treat uh, in hospital uh, and often we'll treat it till troponin comes down uh, or starts coming down before we send a patient home. That's more the acute stuff, but there's obviously an ongoing question about, okay, well, what about the patient who doesn't present acutely with florid chest pain uh, with this during acute COVID-19? Could there be myocarditis in the group of patients who are more in the post-COVID clinic syndrome type mold, or at least had COVID outside in the community and were quite well? And um, What we had was a paper that came from Germany, from Frankfurt, um, that uh, was in, came out in the summer and found this. This is a study putting a load of patients through an MRI scanner who in the main had mild COVID. So it's just randomly selecting a load of patients who have mild COVID and plonking them in an MRI scanner and finding that 78% uh, had cardiac involvement 
78%, I'll just reiterate that, and 60% had myocardial inflammation. So this study suggests that every single patient who gets COVID-19 has a 60% chance of showing myocardial inflammation on MRI. We wouldn't believe this study. I'll be blunt from the outset. Uh, the way that they looked at this was quite interesting, shall we say, for those who do this. It seemed odd and it was extraordinary. So if you look at what happened, the senior author of this said, a lot of papers get downloaded 10 times, maybe 20. This paper got downloaded 550,000 times. Fascinating, you know. It's actually quite a low impact journal, this paper. It's got downloaded more times than many nature articles will. You know, it's extraordinary. So myocarditis, and then they put this is the same article, the top concern, COVID-19 for college athletics. So th this paper kicked off, as I said in the title here, it made the whole, it made, it made COVID myocarditis go viral, this paper. And then a whole load of Twitter debate started around this paper, led by someone called Daryl Francis, who some of you may know, uh, Simon will know. So Daryl's uh, one of the lead cardiologists at the Hammersmith, uh, and statistically is better than anyone I think I've probably ever met statistically. He's a high-flying academic who's particularly interested in statistics. He has a long track record of picking up papers where people in effect have either done things wrong with data or being blunt made data up. So if you follow Daryl's background, you'll see he's very into research fraud. And they got their teeth into this paper and found a whole load of the statistics didn't make sense. Frank Murphy is a consultant, is a cardiologist across the pond uh, in the States. So there's a whole load of stuff around the statistics that make sense. Some of the points on the graph don't, don't seem to exist from some of the data that has been suggested. And the paper actually was then taken offline and redone uh, as a result of that and then re-uploaded with different statistics saying still shows the same thing. Uh, and this group thinking, we still don't find these statistics work, but that was kind of the end of it at that point. There's subsequently been two papers from London that really, I would say, seriously question what you're seeing in that original paper. So this one actually came from my previous research group, uh, James Moon uh, at Bart's uh, Hospital. This took a load of healthcare professionals. I think it was about 200 healthcare professionals, of which about 50% had COVID and 50% didn't. They all went through a magnet, an MRI scanner. There was no difference in what you found in the group that had COVID to the group that, group that didn't have COVID. But bear in mind, so this group, this group is telling you there is no signal at all, versus this group is telling you 60% of people have a signal. I mean, it could not be more different, this. I mean, it's extraordinary, this. There's also been a paper uh, done as a collaborative approach across North London, um, led by the Royal Free, which looked at patients in hospital with a high troponin, i.e. people who were sick, about 25% had myocarditis. So 25% of people who are, you know, almost at death, at death's door sick with a positive troponin will have myocarditis. Here they're saying mild illness, 60% have it. I, I just do not believe this data. I'm quite frank, open and honest about it. This data is so different to anything else that's out there, but it's been downloaded a lot and it frequently rears its head in many consults I do actually um, with in, post, in the post-COVID patients. So it's well quoted by patients, uh, and it's interesting that one of the questions on the chat thread originally was about this. Some of the issues to think about with this, uh, the intricacies of what we do in MRI are not so easy in post-COVID syndrome. So younger women who are the more common group to have post-COVID syndrome, how often have thin myocardium? That's just being female just means you tend to have slightly thinner myocardium. That makes it harder to image. It's also much harder to image fast moving hearts. So in MRI, the slower your heart rate, the better the image is. So if you've got sinus tap in thin myocardium, it's very easy to overcall things. And my suspicion is what you're seeing in the original paper was a lot of observer bias, actually, uh, because of that. But you can make up your own minds about it. The last little bit here was about pericarditis, which is information of pericardium, which may or may not exist with myocarditis. Um, if it's pericarditis on its own, the troponin is negative because troponin leak is from myocytes, not from pericardium. And as you'll all know, the pain tends to be sharp and positional, often based on history, CRP, negative troponin. Echo is usually going to be normal. Sometimes you see bright pericardium, although it's hard to interpret that. If you really want to go to town, sometimes these patients will go for an MRI scan to look for pericardial information, but usually actually it's a, uh, uh, based on history, CRP, uh, and often ECG uh, changes that you make the diagnosis. Tend to treat it with culture scene, 
Prognosis usually is good, usually self-limiting, occasionally can be aggressive pericarditis, but most of the time it will just get better on its own. You can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in the younger, fitter patients. Of course, in hospital, often we seen patients more, a bit more comorbid if they've got a bit of kidney injury. So culture seems tend to be more common uh, for us, but non-steroidals are fine. So I'll leave you with this. This is a pathway that we came up with for our long COVID clinic that general practice, as also many general practitioners local to us have seen. Um, you don't have to go down this path. It gives you some idea of what you might want to think about a patient with chest pain. So you've got no obvious cardiac cause suggested from the history from the, which suggests anything else. Is it an obvious, yeah, is it obviously sound like a, a gastroesophageal reflux or whatever. I think if it's exertional pain, you're going to end up referring, as I said. If it's non-exertional, my personal view, and it harks back to the question actually about how do you not overwhelm services? You've got to try and think, well, what am I going to do? Where am I going to set the bar with this? You can do a CRP and troponin. Now, CRP clearly no issue in primary care. Troponin in primary care causes massive debate. I would say about 50% of GPs I speak to are well up for it and 50% are vehemently against it. <laughs> so I can argue the topic about it, but it's up to you. You can do it because if these things are normal, it makes myocarditis and pericarditis unlikely. I don't mean it's definitely not that, but it just adds a bit of weight to what you think already probably is not going to find you any yield. It just helps a little bit if you're going to go down the reassurance line and think about other things. But if they're high here, you're generally going to refer on to cardiology and probably if those things are high, you're probably going to end up in the patient the MRI scanner to look at it in more detail. That was the end. Um, so just a way of trying to think about what you might do with chest pain. Um, and so what I might do is stop my screen share. I'm gonna have a look at some of the questions. Uh, so one of the questions was that's hilarious, but I don't was it was that a bit about us being wanna be fighter pilots, I'm guessing. <laughs> it probably won't be news to Simon that one. <laughs> um, okay. So what about the PE we all worried about missing as GPs? You know, one of the things that worries me is the odd really bad post-COVID patient I see who's plonked themselves in bed and doesn't want to get out of bed, clearly is plonking themselves at very high risk of PE. Um, that is a problem. I, I don't have any, any particular advice about this. I mean, clearly it's going to be about taking a history. You may want to think about D-dimer. You know, it's, it's that sort of line of thinking uh, about this. Um, so, you know, as I say, there's, there's no magic bullet. You've just got to, you know, in a patient who's not winning in the end, you may want to think about a D-dimer with it. Um, what else have we got? So that was PE. How to distinguish symptoms of myocardial infarction from myocarditis? Often it presents the same. So if you look at the story, the, the presentation for a lot of myocarditis, patient comes in, they're usually young, they've usually had a viral prodrome, they've usually got troponin rise, sometimes ST elevation, sometimes ST depression. And then there's the usual debate in hospitals, should they go to the cath lab? They're 20, they've got no risk factors, surely this won't be coronary disease. Sometimes people will take them to a cath lab, sometimes people won't. So, you know, sometimes in the end, you can only know by doing tests. And in the end, MRI is going to tell you the difference between the two because the difference is what you see on, uh, on, on latent heart and imaging from, from MRI. So a patient who's got a high troponin in the end is gonna go down the route of an MRI scan if you're debating myocarditis or myocardial infarction. If they've got loads of risk factors, you cap them first. But in the end, in hospital, uh, they will end up in an MRI scan if that debate is still ongoing. How long does troponin remain raised after acute COVID? Um, that is an interesting question. There is the odd patient who's in a study called, I think, post-COVID, where they're measuring troponins quite routinely, who have got who've got elevates, very low-grade elevated troponins for a while. The majority of myocarditis patients acutely, the troponin will go up, and then probably within a week or two, their troponin will be normal, sometimes even by the time they leave hospital. It depends a bit on how high the troponin went, obviously, as to how far down it's got to go to get to normal. The concern if someone's running a chronically slightly raised troponin then is, why that should be, have they got some underlying structural heart disease? So we see this quite a lot in patients who've got heart failure, or you might see it in inherited heart disease for people who are quite well. So there's a whole number of reasons why it might happen, or it could be that they've got ongoing myocarditis. So it depends. The majority of patients, it will, it will be, it should be normal reasonably quickly. And if it's still high, you're going to want the cardiologist involved with this to have a think about why. 
Other thing is renal failure, and renal failure patients often run a chronic high troponin. And then there's a question, I think the last one I was, that we've got on here was, I've had a male patient in his 30s, palpitations post-exercise, and after eating, uh, since viral infection, that may or may not be COVID, normal troponins, uh, has become obsessed with the idea he might have myocarditis and wants a cardiac MRI. This is purely on the back of a friend who previously had myocarditis. Could he be right and could, it ha could have it despite the normal test? If you look at the autoimmune disease patients who uh, are my main group that I look after with myocarditis, uh, so it's my research interest is autoimmune disease, it's very unusual for them to have abnormal MRI scans with normal troponins. I would say that MRI is a bit like chest X-ray for pneumonia. The troponin will be normal before the MRI scan will normalize with myocarditis. So if you had myocarditis today, and we scan you again in, in two months time, you may have a normal troponin, but still some evidence of, of a bit of high T2, uh, for example. So I usually wait six months before looking again. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's difficult. I would say a patient like this, I would be heavily reassuring because the next question would be, okay, so let's say he did, what would you do? Because there's no known treatment to myocarditis anyway. I mean, people often use colchicine because it's anti-inflammatory in myocarditis, but no, there's actually no study showing that colchicine is a useful thing to give or non steroid Those things have been shown to work in pericarditis, so, so we tend to use them. But the reality here is, you know, pal for palpitations, really for me, all I'd be doing with someone like that is 24 hour tape and seeing what the cause of the palpitations are, if it's sinus attack, reassure, reassure, reassure. So I wouldn't be jumping to put someone like that in the MRI scanner, no. Uh, is the answer to that question. Uh, could he be right? Probably not. Um, you know, I, my personal view is it's very unlikely. That's not how myocarditis would generally present. Uh, and then there's the last question here. So myocarditis is not so common in long COVID. Uh, and my personal view is actually to agree with that, particularly now you've got a study showing that actually myocarditis post COVID in healthcare professionals is actually incredibly rare. Um, and I think if you put all of this literature together, some of the problem that you're seeing are issues around people overcalling things on MRI scans. So then are there stats of how many patients with no significant cardiac risk factors develop cardiac disease post COVID? I don't think there is. What I would say to you is if you listen to all the chat we have in the Pan London group, the majority of patients that we're seeing, we don't find stuff with when we go looking. There is some who do have myocarditis. Uh, that's been more commonly seen at one center than in other centers, I would say. And that may reflect how people are reporting scans, or it may not, we don't know. Um, but what I would say is it reassures me greatly that you've got a big study now but showing that, you know, if you take 100 people who've had COVID um, and 100 people who haven't had COVID, you see no difference in the MRI scans with that. Now, that's not a group of people with long COVID. So that's a group of people who healthcare professionals, some of whom might have long COVID, but it's just a random selection of 100 healthcare professionals who've had COVID and 100 controls who didn't. But as I said, my, my personal view with this is in the young fit person, in the end, a lot of reassurance is, is the aim with this. If they've got ongoing stuff, despite negative CRP and troponin, you may end up doing more with them because they'll push you towards it because they'll all be chatting on their Facebook you know, sort of fora about this sort of thing. And that paper from Germany causes a lot of grief with this, I would say. And as I say, my personal view is I don't believe that paper. I think that paper is just wrong. Um, and as I say, after all the data I've seen subsequently and all the patients I've seen subsequently, this is not a common thing to find. It's something you do find, but it's not like a 60, 70%. You know, it's not like most people have it. It's more uncommon than that. The other thing is, why would you have chest pain with something that's no longer inflamed? So ongoing, the majority of patients that we've seen, we've looked at this actually in our viromyocarditis group pre-COVID, the vast majority of patients when you follow them up don't have ongoing symptoms. The, the proven myocarditics don't get ongoing symptoms of chest pain. They tend to get the acute event and it gets better and it goes away. You get a handful that do get ongoing symptoms, but that is not the vast majority. The vast majority of viral myocarditis is nasty when it happens, and then it gets better with the virus getting better. Um, and maybe with some culture scenes, it tends to get better. A lot of the long COVID patients, this is not what you see. Ongoing chest pain, you know, 
often very atypical. So, uh, you know, this is not an easy problem. But all I would say, the other last thing I would say about this, what we want to do along the Pan London Group is see what our outcomes look like. I don't know of a patient in this predicament who's died. So, you know, and, and when we talked about it, none of us are aware of any patient who's been like, because in the end, it's like, well, if their LV function is normal, that's a good start. I'm not going to get heart failure at that point. Are they going to die with it? Are they going to arrhythmia and die? We, we're not seeing problems like this with this. What we're seeing, in effect, if you look at the, if you believe the original paper is you're seeing some minor things on MRI, but actually that are not translating into terrible outcomes at this point, but it's still early days. So, so I've overrun a bit with all the questions. So I hope that was okay. Thank you so much uh, to Dan and Simon, some really brilliant, um, interesting presentations. And thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We hope you've also enjoyed it. Um, I'll be sending out some attendance certificates. So if there's any changes in names or email addresses that you didn't sign up to the event with, just pop them in the chat um, and we can amend those. We've also got a really quick two minute survey that we'd be really grateful if you guys could complete. Um, just to give us a bit of feedback on what worked well and how we can improve for our upcoming event. So I'll just pop that in the chat now. And we'll also be sending around the recording of this event and any materials uh, that Dan and Simon have provided. Um, so you'll get that either this afternoon or, or tomorrow morning. So thanks again, and we hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.